Hello Scrap Spot family. Thanks for tuning in. You're about to listen to a very engaging documentary. May I suggest that you listen to these episodes with headphones on or on a really good stereo to get the full ambient effect. We at Scraps take pride in making such productions and conveying these factful stories. So if you like what you hear or if you don't, please do let us know. on our social media page on linkedin and twitter we do love hearing from you finally these type of productions take a lot of resources and time while we spend our own time over the evenings and weekends and we have very accommodating families the cost of the production is something that we bear personally between myself and jojo plat So if you want to contribute in a small way to help us bring such content to you please go to our donate page on our website scrapspodcast.com and provide us with a donation we will be eternally grateful and so will the rest of the scrap spot family This is a scrap studio production and you're listening to the inflammatory wanderer A Scraps original podcast that seeks to unpick, untangle and chronicle the perceived eureka moment in the acquaintances that the human race has made with the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus for the treatment of many disorders, specifically some of the immune mediated inflammatory disorders. In the last episode, we went through some key facts about how the information that the main character in the story, the vagus nerve, and how it conveys information to the brain. But the information that we specifically spoke of was the conveyance of sensory information that pertains to how mediators of inflammation gets transduced from the liver by the work of Linda Watkins at University of Colorado who built on some seminal work of Hugo Besedowski. It was Linda Watkins' work that built on some seminal work by Hugo Besedowski that led a scientist and a trained neurosurgeon from New York to build on the knowledge that if sensory information is communicated to the brain via the hepatic vagus as shown by Linda Watkins something must happen in the brain to process it and to send it back down for the body to react none of this is new physiologists have been dealing with reflexes in regulation of body homeostasis for centuries and we also explain how some basic autonomic functions like blood pressure and heart rate control works via such mechanisms and it was really a shot in the dark at the time to understand what would happen if one stimulated the vagus nerve to understand how this would change the perception of inflammation in the animal models that they were studying and in fact most things in science are exactly that a shot in the dark before a prepared mind unpicks the effect to make sense of how such an effect has happened I am Arun Shridhar and I am Jojo Platt and this is the inflammatory wanderer Now 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 we learned of how the information gets transduced and this leads to a cascade of events that leads to dampening of inflammation and just to recap nerves like the hepatic vagus signal the inflammatory signals to the brain as evidenced from the work from Linda Watkins as we outlined then based on all the evidence around nicotinic receptors and nicotine itself being beneficial in regulating lymphocyte function and lymphocyte being the key white blood cell stimulation of the vagus was tried in an effort to affect acetylcholine release over the course of a number of years the dampening of inflammation termed as the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway was deduced What does that look like? As I said, inflammatory cytokines or mediators trigger vagal sensory signaling from the hepatic branch of the vagus to the brain stem. And then motor signals is proposed to travel down the vagus to the junction box, the celiac plexus. Yes, this celiac plexus which sits in the abdomen receives both parasympathetic input via the vagus and also sympathetic input via the splanchnic nerve a nerve root that comes out of the spinal cord at the level of the celiac plexus another offshoot of this junction box goes to the spleen and this nerve uses noradrenaline 
as a neurotransmitter. So that's pretty cool. The input to the ganglia is both vagal and sympathetic, but the output is sympathetic. Yes, it is in the case of the splenic nerve. The splenic nerve releases noradrenaline that activates the lymphocytes or T cells. This T cell releases another neurotransmitter, and this time it's acetylcholine. This, in turn, activates the macrophages to stop releasing inflammatory mediators, shutting down the inflammation. So in disease conditions, this balance of autonomic tone can go awry, and vagal stimulation is proposed to activate this reflex to dampen the inflammation. And with the evidence in IBD that we discussed, that cigarette smokers had lower incidence of IBD in a small trial, and how nicotine dampened the inflammation in IBD patients, Add to this the models of endotoxemic shock that was tested, which involves injecting rodents with a lethal dose of lipopolysaccharide, a protein that is abundant in bacterial coats. So from here, with all the evidence in sepsis, how did a company that licensed the intellectual property move into treating patients with rheumatoid arthritis? What's the correlation between sepsis and arthritis? Have you ever wondered? If so, you're not alone. Well... If you wondered how that innovation came about, we're going to tell you exactly that. But before we go there, can we go back to the New York Times article? This article, titled, Can the Nervous System Be Hacked?, cites the then Setpoint's chief medical officer, Ralph Zitnik, who hired Paul Peter Tark, a rheumatologist, to do a clinical trial. Was it a case of the company suggesting that, or was it a bit more systematic? The article embellishes the Eureka moment again. That light bulb glowing in somebody's head to quench the darkness of the world. But really, how did it all come about? We were very skeptical of this hyping of the Eureka moment. So we went to two sources. One was the then CEO of Setpoint Medical, Tony Arnold. So I know that initially Setpoint Medical was focused on sepsis to some degree, and that there was a pivot to look at rheumatoid arthritis. Can you, if, if you can, walk us through what the decision process was like and, um, and what precipitated that? Yeah, Jojo, those were really the early days. Um, the sepsis days were very early. Now, we continued to think about sepsis for many years. It came up, you know, five, 10 years into the company being well-established as a potential application. But the decision to pivot from sepsis happened, happened really early. It, it was at the very beginning of my time. And by the time I, I started as a consultant for the company, for the then CEO of the company and for one of the investors. And at that point, we were finalizing that decision and we had already identified Crohn's and RA as our targets. And the thinking on sepsis was it often happens acutely, episodically. And there was a question around would a, we were focused on a permanent implant, would a permanent implant be applicable for an acute episodic event? Or would we be better suited to a chronic disease state? And we obviously came to the conclusion that the form factor we were aiming for was going to be better suited for chronic disease than for uh, for you know, episodic related things. So at that point, there was always a thought of trying to use an external stimulator or ear stimulator to treat um, short term acute conditions. And I believe you know Feinstein and that team have taken that IP and have continued to try to advance that IP. And Setpoint is focused from the very early, early on days focused on chronic disease. So how did this vision of the company to go for chronic diseases like arthritis and Crohn's materialize? Was it through the ingenuity of said academic, who by now had his manuscripts accepted at Nature and filed patents that built on the idea of nicotinic receptors being involved in reducing inflammatory bowel disease incidents? But before we go there, and for our listeners, it is important to differentiate between what is impactful. A manuscript or a patent application? They are two totally different beasts. While one can build on the other, patents in the US usually are provided to a method and with all the existing information available in the late 90s, it was easy to postulate that vagus nerve stimulation might potentially release 
acetylcholine that acts on some nicotinic receptors somewhere to reduce the incidence of IBD. Of course, on top of IBD, you can drop in other immune-mediated inflammatory disorders to claim in the patents. But patents are always done to protect the idea for a commercial enterprise. And that succeeded and led to the licensing of the idea to create Setpoint Medical. But what about the other side? The side where achievements are spoken about day in and day out. And then when the commercial enterprise succeeds, one calls it the ingenuity of one person. In this case, a neurosurgeon and a physician scientist from New York. Was it really that work done in the labs of the Feinstein Institute lead directly to the clinical study in rheumatoid arthritis patients? Or was it something else? But before we go there, let's understand how Setpoint Medical, that licensed Dr. Tracy's IP from the Feinstein Institute, did its trial. They did something that, to me, was mind-boggling. Not because of what they did, but because how their device manufacturers did not have a stake in what they did at Setpoint. Let me explain. Here's Tony Arnold again. Setpoint was really unique in my view in that most of the technologies I'd been involved with prior to Setpoint, it was a group of technologists that delivered a technology, and then we went looking for the application for the technology. No surprises there. Pretty much how almost every major medical device company or a neuromodulation company that's out there started. Uh, We did it right at set point. We had, we knew we wanted to go for chronic inflammatory diseases and we knew that there was no perfect system for that out there. So we designed this system around the disease state. This was done through them hiring Mike Faltes, an engineer who cut his teeth developing technologies like the Bion in the late 90s. And we knew what that system would look like largely. Mike and I developed a lot of active implantable systems, some of those together. We both knew a lot of surgeons, so we knew what we wanted to do to deliver a system. But there was a problem. Companies are funded by venture capital investors. And these venture capital investors love to see the biggest risks burn down. Although they love to say they take novel ideas and push them, here is what happened to this novel idea of wanting to use vagus nerve stimulation to treat rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease. Naturally, what investors wanted to see was, hey, before we invest tens of millions in a system, can you prove that this works first? You know, we don't want to invest tens of millions get a platform working, and then find out that the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway doesn't work in humans. So the challenge to me was before we fund you, find a way to give us a signal that this will work. And uh, that's a challenge. You know, we knew we needed um, daily stimulation of the vagus nerve, and we knew that we were unable to get the level of activation we needed non-invasively. We could not get that, and we tried everything. So when we started looking for what's a reliable way to um, depolarize the vagus nerve and fire the fibers we need to fire, uh, it really came down to cyberonic. And for the uninculcated, remember the vagus nerve stimulation in epilepsy patients that we spoke of in the last episode. The one implant, as outlined in the previous episode that was approved, when our young trainee neurosurgeon, Dr. Tracy, was learning the ropes in medicine. Cyberonics was this company that developed the paradigm of vagus nerve stimulation for the treatment of refractory epilepsy in the 1980s. And had then moved to depression and even got FDA approval even prior to set point was started. Cyberonics was then bought by another medtech company, Soren Medical, and the merged entity is now called as Levanova. So you can say Cyberonics was the go-to device manufacturer. And if you're a Levanova corporate executive team member, you should probably go get a towel and bury your face in it. While you're at it, go ahead and bite that towel so you don't bite your own tongue at the missed opportunity that is about to now be disclosed. They had an approved device that could go in humans and we can get clinical data with. So we identified that as our fastest possible path. Um, We approached Cyberonics directly. Cyberonics told us um, just flat no. We love your project. We're very interested in it. But the risk to us and our ongoing business, if you have a 
serious adverse event that we have to report is unacceptable. So, um, I- well, there you have it. Cyberonics essentially said, we want nothing to do with you. I have seen this in pharma too myself. If a drug is approved for a given indication, any work that is done with the approved drug by the maker is tightly controlled. But this is where one needs to question the brains that let the missed opportunity slip. And Tony Arnold did some work to get things moving, despite the hiccup. And before we go any further, we must say none of what is going to be disclosed next is bad or illegal. But if you are a Levanova employee or an executive team member, get the towel and bite it even harder. So um, I've been around the industry a long time and... uh Got on the phone with some friends, started talking to people around the world. We found a distributor in the uh, Middle East, I'll say, that said, hey, I can, I can get your products. We have several on the shelf. I can get more within days. It'd probably be safest if you buy them all at once because we may only do it once. So um, we agreed to a price. I um, got ready to wire the money to this distributor. And he said, by the way, I, I do my banking in Syria. I just wanted to make sure that's okay. I said, no, that, that's not okay. Actually, the, we can't bank with, we can't trade bank transactions with Syria due to uh, Department of Homeland Security regulations. And so with lots of trying around and um, adjusting things, we finally found a way to get legitimate payment to them get the devices, get them to the U.S., get them over-labeled and over to Amsterdam for the first study with Professor Paul Peter Tack at the AMC, the medical center there in Amsterdam. So it was a circuitous route. It was exciting. Um, It took a lot of connections, a lot of people I could think, but I I, I could probably should thank, but they'd rather me not use their names. So uh, just anyway, it was a, it was a great adventure and it led to just a tremendous success in a pilot trial. So Tony just threw out a name, Paul Peter Tuck. I know Paul Peter as a former colleague at GSK, the company that I work for. But prior to moving to work for GSK, Paul Peter Tuck was at Amsterdam Medical Center. So to quell all those ideas who think based on the New York Times article that it was one scientist at Northwell Health who spawned this field and innovation Let's get down to the memory lane and show the actual sequence of innovation. But before that, let's understand who Paul Peter is. Yeah, absolutely. I spent a significant part of my career as an academic uh, rheumatologist. I was a professor of medicine and clinical immunology and rheumatology at the Academic Medical Center of the University of Amsterdam for many, many years. And my goal was really to give my patients the best treatments that were available, but also to develop the best treatments for the future. And I've come to the conclusion that the goal should be at least to induce disease remission, in other words, absence of disease activity at any time point in patients with chronic inflammatory diseases. And rheumatoid arthritis is a prototypic immune-mediated inflammatory disease. I abbreviate that as IMID. And lessons learned there are relevant for other IMIDs, think about inflammatory bubble disease, Crohn's disease, etc. So, and I've also come to the conclusion that it's probably unlikely currently that there would be a single therapeutic intervention that would lead to uh, disease remission in all patients. Uh, and therefore we've used very different approaches and maybe um, it's interesting to explain how I, how I got interested in the field of bioelectronics in rheumatoid arthritis because that was not completely planned. Actually, we were looking for something completely different. Um, Many patients with um, rheumatoid arthritis who are receiving systemic treatments will do quite well, but they will still have one or two or three joints that are still active. And as a clinician, the question then is, well, what do you do, right? Do you change the systemic therapy? Actually, things may go worse. Or do you try to uh, improve Uh, that specific joint with local treatment. So that was our focus. And we uh, set up a biotech company at the time called Aftrogen, aimed at developing intra-articular gene therapy to basically create new homeostasis in that specific joint by the expression of anti-inflammatory mediators under the control of an inflammation-dependent promoter. That was the idea. 
So if the, if the inflammation is in the joint, why don't we directly apply some form of inflammatory reductive therapy, which in this case was a gene therapy, uh, directly to the place where the inflammation is actually occurring in the knee, right? So, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. right. As a physician, I would say there's no place in the body that cannot be easily reached with a needle. In the, uh, in the hands of an experienced rheumatologist, you can inject something into a joint yeah. in a few minutes. And if you are really experienced, it's basically almost painless. Uh, and, and, but we don't have a lot of therapeutic options. What you can do is actually inject corticosteroids, triamcinolone, but it has side effects. You can't do it more than four times a year. It doesn't work in everybody. So we thought of maybe we can develop something more sophisticated. So we created a, a biotech company at the time. And we also wanted to create a new discovery portfolio and find new therapeutic targets that we could clone into our vectors, which were at the time, I don't know, associated viruses, AAV. And we worked together uh, in those days with Galapagos, well-known biotech company, and we created um, together an assay based on an shRNA as, uh, screen, uh, and we took biopsies from patients with active inflammation. So we did arthroscopy, took synovitis samples, and then isolated one of the key cell types that are probably uh, responsible for autonomous disease progression called the fibroblast-like synoviocytes. These are thromal cells. So we tested these cells in culture after doing the arthroscopy and the isolation pr procedure and culture. And then we treated them with the shRNA library and looked at the effects of many, many genes and then um, the readout was focused on interleukin-8, which is a cytokine and the chemokine, intimately involved in inflammation, including in rheumatoid arthritis. And the other component of the disease process in RA is about joint destruction, tissue damage. Yeah. And again, this is a story that's relevant for many chronic mm -hmm. inflammatory diseases, because tissue destruction will ultimately uh, predict disability in these patients, right? Think of bone, cartilage. So we also looked at matrix metallo proteinases produced by these fibroblast-like synophysites in culture. And then we had multiple hits. But one very interesting hit was actually the alpha-7 uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Mm. And that was really not what we were looking for, right? This was completely unbiased research. And then I thought, oh, what is the alpha-7 receptor for short doing as a regulator of inflammation and potentially destruction, right? So we cultured again cells, and then we uh, exposed the cells to nicotine, which has many effects, including stimulation of the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine mm -hmm. receptor. And we could actually see effects on IL-8 and IL-6 and MMPs indeed. And then we thought, well, nicotine is doing more than just uh, stimulating this receptor. Let's now use more specific receptor agonists that we got from biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies and we could show that there was actually an anti-inflammatory effect. So that was truly interesting. And um, then we thought, well, is this relevant in vivo? So we induced collagen-induced arthritis, which is a well-known model of rheumatoid arthritis in yeah. mice, uh, in alpha-7 knockout mice. So we knocked out this yeah. pathway. And you know what we found? We found increased arthritis activity and we found increased destruction. Yeah. Suggesting that the alpha-7 so is an alpha-7 nicotinic receptor is a very important part in the disease pathology. Yeah. Exactly, so not only in acute models of inflammation as it has been shown by Kevin Tracy and others who have been pioneers in the field of the role of the alpha-7 receptor in acute models of in inflammation, think of LPS models, but we were the, sh the first to show this in a chronic model of inflammation. But then the question is, of course, we don't want to exacerbate uh, arthritis, we want to improve it. So we actually treated the mice first with nicotine in the drinking water, and we could show that there was a decreased arthritis activity and again, against, um, also protection against joint destruction. But then we thought, well, let's do it in a more controlled way. We repeated the experiment using IP, intraperitoneal injection of nicotine, we found the same. And then people could say, well, maybe it is via a different receptor because it's a pleiotropic effect. So then again, we used the alpha-7 receptor specific agonist that we got from other companies. And we could reproduce this beneficial effect. So first, 
I'm not saying that Nicotin is a great idea for patients uh, with rheumatoid arthritis. Actually, we know that smoking will make things worse, but that is actually because of all the other factors that are in smoke, right? And many, many other compounds. So <laughs> smoking is in general very bad for you, but it gave us great proof of mechanism that stimulation of this pathway could have a beneficial effect. Then we also did an experiment because we started to think about the vagus nerve, which will ultimately lead to acetylcholine release and stimulation of the alpha septum receptor. So we did a unilateral phagotomy. So we dissected the vagus nerve in this same mouse model. You need to do it unilateral, otherwise the yeah. mouse stop breathing. Yeah. And we, we could show again that there was an increase in arthritis activity and other people have reproduced these, all of these findings actually. And we've done it multiple times with different alpha-7 agonists. So in short, we had shown in vitro and in models where we actually interrupt, disrupt this uh, pathway, the so-called cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, also called the uh, inflammatory reflex, that if you disrupt this by unilateral phagotomy or by knocking out the alpha-7 receptor, there is increased arthritis. If you do exactly the opposite and you treat the mice with, let's say, alpha-7 uh, receptor agonist, you will actually get improvement. And then we thought, well, maybe we could reproduce this by electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve. And that's when we started to talk to a company called Setpoint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And US. before you go to the Setpoint story, I just want to ask you a bit more about yeah. the chronology of events. I think you describe you describe the events very beautifully, but just so that I have the timings correctly in my mind, right? So when you describe the whole arthrogen story, which I think both of our good friend, Marguerite, uh, is, was actually working with you at the time uh, through arthrogen. Yeah, she was my uh, chief uh, COO correct, at the correct. time at, at my company, yeah, correct. Arthrogen. Yeah. So I think, can you just describe the, the years during which you actually kind of went from work, looking at gene therapy for, for RA over to kind of discount? So give us the time period that you're talking about in terms of the years. Yeah, yeah. this was all uh, between 2006 and 2009. 2006 and 2009, yeah. And based, based, based on our preclinical work, we have postulated for the first time in the literature in 2009, uh, published in Nature Reviews Rheumatology, the idea that you could treat potentially rheumatoid arthritis patients with electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve or with alpha-7 agonists. So we have published this idea uh, many, many years ago. So did you get all that? All the work to deduce the mechanistic basis for ensuring that a trial can be run was done between 2006 to 2009, at which point Tony Arnold was also looking for an application for their technology, which they thought would be a way to stimulate the vagus with a pill-sized device that did not have any large pulse generator and one that could be powered from outside using a neck brace and speak to a physician's controller through Bluetooth. At this point... I also want to break the bubble that Setpoint Medical was the first miniaturized stimulator. From the early 2000s, a company called Autonomic Technologies did develop the world's first battery-less implant that could be powered from outside using the patient's remote placed on the cheek to treat cluster headaches. So Setpoint Medical was building on this innovation to create their own device. How did Tony Arnold and Paul Peter Tuck devise their plan to get into their clinical trial to test vagus stimulation for rheumatoid arthritis? As Paul Peter suggested, their work went from proving that alpha-7 nicotinic receptors were important in patient biopsies with arthritis, and this led to the unplanned experiment in Paul Peter's story. In fact, it was an accident that was born out of the idea of gene therapy for arthritis, and not necessarily as one where people were looking for stimulating the vagus to treat immune-mediated inflammatory disorders. Yeah, and, any, and one more thing is that at this point of time, all of the data that was shown in the literature at that point of time was all in acute inflammatory models or sepsis models, which is the introduction of LPS or injection of LPS, close to fatal amount of LPS. Most of it was done in an acute terminal preparation, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to make sure that I get yeah. my bearings right in terms of, of the type of data that was in the literature. And what you're suggesting is that the movement of that from 
a gene therapy idea to an alpha 7 knockout animal then over to CIA uh, kind of chronic models and looking at nicotine uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of agonism uh, as as a as a potential treatment was all done or the movement of that was actually done in cro- all of them in chronic animal models which yeah. is was never done and and then from there you went from vagotomy over to vagal stimulation just yeah, want to make sure that i have right. the 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 sequence of events correct in yeah. especially in terms of years yeah no i really you're absolutely right so that actually there was not the reason that we got into this field there was just completely unplanned experiment that we were actually looking for new targets for gene therapy in in uh, intraarticular treatment of RA and then we found this alpha 7 receptor and then we did all this work in chronic models for the first time and you know typically most experiments fail right this is a feature of science unfortunately and you learn it's an iterative process but here basically every experiment worked and i did this in my lab in amsterdam with a very small group of people uh, including a very talented scientist magriet van vordeldank and two phd students and supported by a few technicians and every experiment worked and we were, were very straight forward in going from reproduction reproduction of the data in um, in vitro experiments using fibroblast like synovicides obtained directly from patients with ra so i'm a big fan of human biology to inform drug discovery because it significantly increases the probability of success that you will have a therapy Correct. at the other end yeah. of it so that's how we worked then from in vitro we went yeah. straight to in vivo to be- get a better understanding of the mechanism in mouse models if you knock out this pathway does it make things worse if you stimulate it does it make things better and then the next step is how could we translate that into a feasible therapy for patients and that's why we started to work to think about electrical stimulation as i postulated in my uh, nature review zoomatology paper in 2009 Yeah. for the first time the yeah. idea was actually proposed in the literature and um and then we started to talk to uh, to set point about doing a collaborative So experiment. did you contact set point or did set point contact you at the time uh, that's a very good question i don't remember that i think they may have consulted i was a consultant to i think in the last two years before i left i, I think see. i was a consultant to 30 companies actually um so i don't know they may have asked me that they, they must have read our literature right about this um, but i'm not yeah, completely yeah. sure who, who contacted who first but to make a long story short we started a, f- a very collaborative and uh, and successful um uh, uh, science project together to find out whether this this could actually uh, be translated based on the bioelectronics approach which would be more attractive i think for patients we felt that there was something missing between the molecular link for alpha 7 nicotinic receptors and arthritis patient biopsies and then ultimately coming up with an idea for vagus stimulation so we probed Paul Peter a little little further as to how the idea for vagus stimulation came to be in his research group's purview and this time it did not involve just animal studies but a more longitudinal follow up over time this is absolutely true there was also in parallel another piece of evidence that suggested that this is relevant in patients right i mean mm. ultimately as I, that's how i started i want to actually improve the life of patients that's my mission in life as a physician and a physician scientist so in parallel we did work that was really very interesting and unique i think at the time we followed a cohort of individuals at risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis so these patients have had never had arthritis and this is all in amsterdam at the time at amc yeah this all work that that we did in amsterdam and i mean there's been a lot of work i can tell you so we reached out for example to family members of rheumatoid arthritis patients asking them can we could you ask your family members right if they're willing to uh, donate some blood and we can test for auto antibodies associated with the development of rheumatoid arthritis which is anti citrullinated peptide antibodies acpas and rheumatoid factor and we also looked at crp we examined these people so we had to test very many people to find uh, people with an auto antibody profile and in our hands we could identify people who would have a risk of developing clinically manifest rheumatoid arthritis within 2 years in about 40% of the cases so that's quite high and we followed these people and looked at many things but we also actually um did a measurement of heart rate variability 
as a, as a measurement of vagus nerve tone. So we did very extensive studies there and we published that and we found in two independent cohorts. So first a test cohort and then a validation cohort to see whether it's really true that decreased vagus nerve tone in this population was an independent predictor of the development of rheumatoid arthritis after follow-up. So that suggested that even in the so-called preclinical stage of the disease, one of the factors that will determine if you are at risk whether you will get RA is actually uh, the autonomous nervous system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's almost like points to the fact that it's, it's a bit causal or potentially causal. Yeah. Um, mechanism. Yeah, what, yeah. what other people have had shown already, so I, I, we, I don't claim this at all, is that in established rheumatoid arthritis, there was there is reduced vagus nerve tone. But then the question is, is that causal, or is it secondary to inflammation, or is it because these people are is less mobile, they go less to the gym, all of that. But by following these people over time, when they are clinically completely healthy. Uh, and finding this as a predictor strongly supports the notion that this pathway is relevant in patients, in humans with chronic inflammatory disease. So all of that together suggested that this was of interest. That's why we pursued this uh, at a fast pace. And then, as I mentioned, we uh, were in contact with um, a set point, which was a fantastic company. And we published together uh, the experiment where in this case, rats with collagen-induced arthritis were treated with uh, vagus nerve stimulation, with an electrical stimulation, for just 60 seconds. And what we found, and we've published it, is that indeed vagus nerve stimulation in this very severe model uh, did reduce arthritis activity and actually protect it against joint destruction. Uh, and it had also all the nice effects on the collagen. And those studies were done, those studies were done at uh, Amsterdam, or was it done? No, that, that physically that experiment was done um, in Setpoint uh, or, or at the CRO, yeah. I forgot. But there was a collaboration. Uh, I'm the last author uh, of that yes, paper. Yes, I'm not with Yaakov uh, Levine is the first author, right? So which I'm very yeah, well exactly. aware of. And, yeah, And he has been a true pioneer in this field and yeah. a fantastic uh, collaborator. So Let's circle back to Tony Arnold, the founding CEO of Setpoint Medical, who had courted Paul Peter Tock through his consultant chief medical officer, Ralph Zitnick. Ralph in turn brought in Paul Peter, who had in parallel done his work on RA patient biopsy samples. Then I asked the neurosurgeons in Amsterdam. Yeah. uh, There is this device, right, that has been approved a long time ago for therapy resistant epilepsy and also sometimes used for therapy resistant Depression. depression. Yeah. And have you, are you able to implant that into my RA, RA patients? And they said, yeah, we've done that. I mean, neurosurgeons uh, can do all kinds of amazing things. Uh, so they said, it's easy and we can do that. So we worked together with the neurosurgery department in Amsterdam and decided to implant the Cyberonics device that was approved, that was on the market. And this clinical trial was sponsored by Setpoint. And it really provided proof of mechanism, at least that's what we hoped to uh, provide, uh, which w- would pa- pave the way actually for the development of new devices. And that's why Setpoint was instrumental and very interested in, in this approach. I know what you're thinking, and I'm not going to contradict you. Science is a story of different pieces of evidence coming together, and sometimes it's about connecting the dots. The only narrative that we are challenging is the fact that everything boils down to this one eureka moment in one person's head as it is routinely portrayed. This, from Paul Peter, will be agreeable to Tony Arnold as well. Yeah, they're both very important people in this field of uh, stimulating for inflammation. In my view, um, having studied it and been involved with it for a decade, I think the, the core idea really does belong to Kevin. You know, the patents and the core idea of doing this belong to Kevin. Um, There were other people that contributed to it, but I think Dr. Tracy really brought it forward, pushed it into a company, had the wherewithal and uh, for us partnering together to just push this thing down the tracks. And, And I bought that view very early on. He sold me on it. And I'll, to give Paul Peter credit, he knew the field well. He understood Tracy's work better than anybody besides Tracy. He knew the potential of it. Well, good, good question. I, actually, I, I don't know uh, that, um, where uh, Setpoint's head was. Probably, I mean, 
if you see um, data in acute inflammation, right, uh, then it's a logical thing to also start to think about chronic inflammation. Although, and for me, it was completely different, right? I, I started, I, I, I built my career at that stage almost completely on RA research. For me, it starts with the yeah. disease. <laughs> I was completely unaware of, of these acute uh, inflammation models. So we, we, we looked in RA for better therapeutic targets for gene therapy. We found the alpha-7 receptor. We did all the preclinical models and it's easy to find when they were published. It's all in the last, uh, the, the, before 2009, 2010. Uh, and we went straight to RA. We never considered going to acute models. I was also not interested in IP. I was 100% academic actually trying to get better treatments. I mean, now I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and a biotech leader, but uh, this is a long time ago when my head was completely focused on, on my patients and doing great translational research to advance the field and uh, without really... Uh, so it was for me clear that we were not going to develop this as a gene therapy. So from an autogen perspective, there was no interest. We just supported it to advance the science. And I wanted to get it into the clinic. And the fact that Setpoint wanted to develop this in RA was just fantastic. So it was a true win-win situation for them to develop a therapy that could be approved one day and for me to advance the science in a great collaboration. So the point of this episode is to show all of you that the real pioneers are not just the ones who are singularly celebrated, but also the ones who join together disparate sources of information as a jigsaw puzzle and to perform studies to verify their thinking. Now with the niceties and factual chronology of how Setpoint Medical did its first trial out of the way, can we turn our attention to the statement that we uttered at the end of episode 1? We had mentioned that the patients in the RA trial were recruited at three clinical trial sites, Amsterdam Medical Center and a couple of other trial sites in Europe and it did not involve a clinical trial site in the United States. And Tony Arnold, the former CEO of Setpoint, did confirm this with us too. In fact, when we went through clinicaltrials.gov, Northwell Health, the institute from which Dr. Kevin Tracy is from, was added as a clinical trial site for a study that started much later in 2018. So, the question that we need to ponder is... Why did the New York Times article describe the patients as Dr. Kevin Tracy's patients? Once again, who are we fooling? And through sources that do not want to be named on this podcast, but have been involved in the first trial that involved four sides as per clinicaltrials.gov. The first one being Amsterdam Medical Center, of which Paul Peter Tak was the principal investigator, and two other sites in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and one in Croatia. It was also mentioned to us that Feinstein Institute representatives asked for details of the patients, managed a few photo opportunities, and publicly started to suggest that RA trial was driven by Dr. Kevin Tracy. If this is not a case of moral plagiarism, I'm not sure what else qualifies to be that. I hope we have proved to you with our interviews and information that is publicly available that all glory does not rest with one person. In fact, kudos must be given where due, which is that the discovery of the involvement of the vagus nerve and its response to stimulation in dampening acute inflammation like sepsis does rest with Dr. Kevin Tracy and his group. But moving that into chronic conditions, especially proving out the hypothesis, and worse, even Justifying the hypothesis to perform a clinical trial did not come from the Feinstein Institute. And I must say, this has continued to this very day, including the most recent article in the Wall Street Journal that was published in July 2022. So, just like every other information that you see, hear and read, I must say they are not what you think they might be, but ones that PR firms and individuals are hired to pitch the stories to reporters who then write up these stories. A non-expert like Alisa Finley of Wall Street Journal or Adam Bryant and Michael Behar of New York Times will give you a story of what is pitched to them 
and what they find as interesting. A thorough investigation was not done to report the facts. In fact, one can say they have portrayed information in a way such that it can be misconstrued that bioelectronic medicines has been the discovery of one human being. We leave it for you to decide. The field of vagus stimulation for rheumatoid arthritis essentially should always refer to two pioneers. But what about the competition? What are the agents that these implantable systems have to compete against? And even within the implantable bioelectronic systems that modulate nerve signals, how is it ever going to translate to commercial success? If you don't understand what we mean, think of this. A rheumatologist prescribes the therapy. A surgeon with no previous access to these patients implants it. The patient reverts back to the rheumatologist who doesn't understand head or tail about how this nerve stimulation works. How does one incentivize a clinician or a patient to use this bioelectronic therapy? And is Vegas the only kid in town for inflammatory disorders treatment? Answers to all of that in our next episode. The Inflammatory Wanderer is a Scraps original mini-series produced by Arun Sridhar and Jojo Platt. The research for the series was conducted by Arun Sridhar. Personal interviews that you hear were conducted by Arun Sridhar and Jojo Platt. Editing was done by Arun and Swaminathan Tirinyana Sambandham was our sound engineer who makes us sound wonderful in your ears. <laughs>